Welcome everyone to our virtual 2020 PWS Family Conference presented by Levo Therapeutics. Before we begin today's presentation, let's first thank our amazing sponsors, Levo Therapeutics, Seleno Therapeutics, Harmony Biosciences, Rhythm Pharmaceuticals, Samiona, and Novo Nordisk. Their support allowed us to make this conference free for all our community members, and we are incredibly grateful for their contributions. In today's session, Acceptance and Commitment Training, Dr. Janice Forster and Dr. Stuart Libman will help build skills for living with greater awareness and openness, openness and engagement in valued life pursuits. This workshop, led by Drs. Janice Forster and Dr. Stuart Libman, will help you improve the skills that will allow to more effectively manage your parenting endeavors. Dr. Forster is a child and an adolescent psychiatrist in private practice in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who specializes in developmental neuropsychiatry. She has over 25 years of clinical experience in the evaluation and treatment of individuals with developmental disabilities. During the 10 years she served as a psychiatric consultant to an inpatient rehabilitation program, she evaluated over 250 individuals with PWS and has managed the severe manifestations of the disorder across all levels of care. She serves as a consultant for the PWSA USA and uh, um, International Prader Willi Organization. Dr. Forster is co-founder of Pittsburgh Partnership, specialist in PWS. She is presented by invitation nationally and internationally on the behavior pheno behavioral phenotype of PWS and psychiatric assessment and management of children and adults with the syndrome. So I, I welcome um, Dr. Forster, who will also be introducing Dr. Libman. Thank you very much. It's an honor and a privilege to present to all of our parents today. Um, and it's also a privilege for me to present our key presenter for today's workshop. I've known Dr. Stuart Libman for over 40 years since the days of our child and adolescent psychiatry training program, where we were littermates. His early emphasis was on family systems theory, and he affiliated with the Western Pennsylvania Family Center as a faculty member. Also, he became the medical director of a program called PLEA, as in Hear Our PLEA, that provided an array of services, including a preschool for young children with language delays who were at risk for developing autism, a school-based partial hospital program for older children and adolescents with severe emotional and behavioral problems, and family-based community services. Under his leadership, Plea integrated applied behavioral analysis and innovative precision teaching methods in the classroom while supporting parents through similar interventions in home-based services. At Plea, there was a natural progression from ABA to ACT, acceptance and commitment training, an intervention that was derived from contextual behavioral analysis, that is a multi-dimensional understanding of factors in influencing behavior, relational frame theory, which is how our brains learn to use language to develop relevant links between experience, thought, and behavior, and mindfulness practices, which are focusing one's attention on experience in the moment without judgment. Picture in your mind, if you will, a flock of at-risk preschoolers lying on their yoga mats, learning how to belly breathe to increase mindfulness. ACT now forms the cornerstone for interventions at PLEA, which has also become the ACT Institute and a sponsor of our grant from FPWR, ACT for Fathers of Adolescents with PWS. ACT is now recognized and implemented across the world as an effective intervention to empower the person, the family, the system of care, and administrative organizations to pursue a, pursue a value-driven, committed course of action moving towards the achievement of goals while um, adapting and accepting the inevitable challenges that get in the way. ACT embraces mindfulness at its core and teaches a set of skills that eventually lead to psychological flexibility. Dr. Libman has taught me how to use ACT in my practice, and I hope that at the end of today's workshop, you will be able to use or begin to use ACT in your daily lives. We may not be able to take away your child's challenging behaviors, but we do hope to have an impact on how you respond in the moment 
keeping in mind what matters most to you in order to reduce your perception of stress and increase your parenting satisfaction. Without further delay, I present my colleague, collaborator, and dear friend, uh, Dr. Stuart Lipman. Thank you, Jan. Uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, and I appreciate the uh, conference sponsors affording us this opportunity. So um, I'm going to shift over to sharing screen, and hopefully that all works just the way we want it to. And I'm hoping everyone has my screen now at this juncture, and we can get things underway. So as, as Jan uh, indicated, uh, first and foremost, uh, let's just get a visual metaphor in play for what she was describing. Um, if we were actually meeting, we might be distributing these finger traps. Although I suspect uh, most, if not all of you remember from childhood, these little finger traps where, where we put our fingers in and uh, then the way out counterintuitively because if we struggle against it just keeps getting tighter and tighter so the nature of the task here is to relax into the trap and by relaxing into the trap we find our way out and, and so let's hold on to that metaphor as we move through this workshop because that's going to be pretty key to understanding uh, what act is all about uh, I too would like to uh, take a moment just to acknowledge the uh, foundation support we've had for this pilot project we're doing, um, where we're doing a four session sequence of moving through ACT for fathers of adolescents with uh, prader willi syndrome. A and what we're going to do in, in our time together today is to move through um, elements of this four session sequence. So you'll not only get a sense of act, but you'll get a sense of the project that we're piloting as well. Well, okay, so, so let's get on with talking some about psychological flexibility using the ACT matrix, this four quadrant visual model that uh, we're going to explore in some detail over the next hour or so. So the, the idea here really is that we're going to get this in play and we're going to practice with this. Now, ACT stands for Acceptance and Commitment Training. And our focus today really is going to be on skill training because we'd really like you to gain some facility with using this. In other settings, the T stands for therapy because acceptance and commitment therapy also is used in settings where more intensive need for help is the order of the day. And we just want to recognize, I mean, we understand that everyone participating in this workshop leads a complicated and challenging an existence. And while we're going to focus today on skill training, we also want to honor the challenge you face and if, if you're already encountering or if the presentation today stirs up some issues that lead you to think, hey, I think I need a little more than just some coaching, just a workshop, uh, we'll provide you with a link at the end and certainly through your own network of contacts in your own local community. I mean, if what you encounter is the sense that you need more than a skill training workshop, uh, by all means, uh, use this as a springboard to getting the additional support that you may need. Um, right now, what we're going to focus on, though, is building psychological flexibility. And, and psychological flexibility is a broader composite skill that consists of three main individual skill sets. The skill of awareness, the skill of engagement, and the skill of openness. And so psychological flexibility itself is a behavioral process. So we're really looking at how can we all modify and raise the level of our behavioral game that is to determine and implement and make warranted changes to sustain a valued course of action, especially under challenging circumstances. 
because we all get knocked off track. It's not about not having that happen. It's how do our values bring us back to the desired direction, what we aspire to be. And so we're going to be looking at building skills for awareness. That is becoming more aware of what's happening both internally and externally. Openness is the ability to become more open to external challenges and internal distress. This is the acceptance piece. And, and it's not really a matter of passive resignation. It's more like learning to make room, like with those finger traps, kind of relaxing into what's going on. And at the same time, learning to be more engaged in doing what matters, especially under challenging circumstances. So just to, to operationalize our terms a little bit, these, these are, these are, this is what we mean when we start to use this terminology. But please note that ACT is also being used in sports and in business settings and nonprofit organizations as well as in families. And, and so while we're going to be focusing today primarily on parenting, you know, feel free to explore this in the other contexts of your lives and, and think about, um, you know, how this might be relevant. Indeed, uh, the lead, the cover article in Sports Illustrated last week was about uh, this model of psychological flexibility being, uh, being used in professional sports. So if, uh, if that piques your curiosity, you might uh, go online and take a peek at that. Um, we're not going to be focusing, though, so much on problem solving. Um, some of that might emerge along the way, but, but as in working with athletes, you know, mental toughness training isn't, doesn't really say, here's how you play your sport. Rather, it's teaching the skills we need to manage ourselves as effectively as we might in the context of our lives. And, and so this is really where our focus is gonna be, you know, respecting the complexity of your lives, not belaboring that right now, but more in the spirit of those airplanes we all used to fly on when they told us to put our own oxygen masks on first. That, that's the spirit of, uh, of what we're seeking to accomplish today. So let's get on with it. That's enough by way of introduction. When we look at the ACT matrix, we make two main distinctions. First of all, we distinguish outer behavior from inner behavior. Outer behavior is more like if we put a video camera on one of us, this is the stuff we can see ourselves doing out in the world. And inner behavior is, speaks more to our thoughts and our images and our memories, our emotions, our sensations, but, but the way we're behaving on the inside. And then we also distinguish towards and away. Towards is moving towards doing things that matter to us. And a way speaks to the moves we make to get away from our distress. And so we wind up with four quadrants. And each quadrant has a question. Um, I'm just going to show you a word at first, and then I'll say the question. Now, I have some prepared answers, because if this was a longer workshop, you know, we would, we would actually collectively respond to these questions. But for our purposes today, I'm going to move through this kind of quickly but not so quickly that there isn't room for you to entertain for yourself to see just what shows up. What thoughts do you have to, when, when, for example, you hear this question, who or what is important to you? What starts to come to mind? The kinds of things we hear from parents are responses like, these, my family, my children, my religion, my job, my health, my, I mean, we're not looking for esoterica here. You know, who and what we care about is sort of, you know, the, the stuff, the substance of our lives. And, and you can go through this again later at your leisure, you know, maybe talk this over with others in your family and just see what kind of responses you have. But for our purposes, what we do need to note is the plot quickly thickens. Because as soon as we start to care about anyone or anything, distress starts to show up. And shows up is the operative notion. I mean, we don't go looking for any of this stuff, right? It's though, what shows up that gets in the way of caring? What right now shows up for you? Maybe some things like, 
feelings, stories, judgments, doubts, right? I mean, this, this, is, this is what we do, right? I mean, these are the things we worry about. These are the challenges we face. And, and again, not to gloss over what really needs to be appreciated, still, let's move on. Because after all, we humans know what to do with distress, right? I mean, we do what we can to avoid it. I mean, the human stress response is so-called fight, flight. And so what do you do to move away from your distress? Well, what do you do? Do you have some favorite away moves? Are there ways, you know, when you're putting things off? We procrastinate, we gossip, we punish, we blame others, we yell, we drink, we... Right? I mean, and, and this isn't to judge. This is to describe. This is to notice. Because if in the short term, the question is, how do these away moves work for us? The answer is, mm, they work pretty well, at least for a little while. Right? But the game of life is structured so that we can run, but we can't hide. So oftentimes, after we move to that upper left quadrant, we wind up over time moving back down to the lower left quadrant. And indeed we can get stuck there because um, you know, we, we, we experience a little bit of relief when we move away. And unfortunately, via what the behavior analysts call negative reinforcement, reinforcement meaning behavior is increasing, but negative meaning it's increasing because we're taking something away and if I do something that takes away a little bit of my distress, uh, the next time I'm in distress, I'm more likely to engage in that behavior again. Well, so the challenge we face is one of engaging. It's what can we do to move towards who or what matters to us, even with our distress, right? Which is key. But what do you do? How do you show caring? If family and children and religion and job and health is, is what you value, what do you do? Well, you hang out, right? You attend to health issues, yours and theirs. You provide support. You do those million little things that show I care. And, and the challenge we face here, right? The challenge is this. It's this vector of psychological flexibility. This is the even with distress. This is the challenge of how do I do what matters to me, even when it's hard, even when it's challenging, right? The 3D box in the middle of noticing is drawn 3D to convey a sense of stepping out of the plane, stepping back, being able to take that mindful breath and notice that the challenge here is, yes, I'm in distress. This isn't, they're there, everything will be fine. I mean, maybe it will be, but maybe not. A and indeed, if we engage in doing things that matters, oftentimes the distress will fade, but not because we're trying to make the distress go away, more because we're getting absorbed in doing something that really matters. So when we talk about the matrix, th this is what we mean. I move through that pretty quickly and we're going to go now go through this in some more detail and look at some of the component skills, but I just wanted to give you an overall sense right away uh, of the nature of the game we're playing here with the matrix. And in terms of those three skill sets, this noticing speaks to awareness, awareing to give it verb form. So that's how awareness starts to connect up in with this model. And over on the left side is where we're becoming more open to, more accepting of distress. And over on the right side is where the engaging happens. So that's what, that's what we're looking for when we start to talk about the matrix. Well, okay, so let's, let's start to move with this. So take a moment, if you will, just to let your thoughts drift back to last fall. You know, um, if you're in an area where the leaves are changing, maybe just starting to change. We're moving towards Columbus Day. We're moving towards Halloween. So just let your thoughts drift back to a memory from last fall. 
And it's not so much about last fall per se. I'm just trying to get a sense of, think about what a year means, right? There's a lot that's gone on because this is, this is pre-Thanksgiving and pre-Christmas and pre-impeachment. And oh yeah, I hear tell there's a global pandemic going on that started about eight months ago. So that's our time frame. That's our time frame for thinking about this question. What would you be doing, right? So we're in the upper part of the matrix. We're interested in behavior. What would you be doing differently a year from now if you could be just a little bit more of the kind of parent you aspire to be? And see what shows up for you. And if some thoughts come to mind, jot them down. And if nothing comes right away, that's okay. You can just sit with the question, right? Just take a few moments to reflect. And while this question is going to guide us, you know, just keep track of other thoughts that show up. This may start to form our Q&A as questions emerge for you. You may have other questions already about the matrix, but, but for right now, just let your thoughts drift to maybe coming to this conference next year. And if you were to think about, wow, here's the progress I've made over the last year, what, what would that start to look like? Now's a moment for a nice meditative breath for you and for me. And then if we go back to our matrix, what you can see is this question is a question for the upper right quadrant. It's the outer behavior aspect of this. It's, yeah, a year from now, if you were going to tuck this matrix away and pull it out, you know, next October, what would you want to be writing about in that upper right quadrant? Now, I mentioned that uh, this is a model that's used in various settings. We're going to look at a brief, just a couple of minute video from a colleague of mine who does organizational research and consultation in England. And so this is a little video that's based in ACT in the matrix, but that uh, is used in um, business settings. This is a story of human motivation. Humans are motivated equally in two directions. To move away from things we don't want and to move towards things we do want. And this is a jolly good idea. It's a particularly good idea for things happening in the external world. But then humans invented language and we develop words for things, including things happening in our internal world, like thoughts and emotions. And then we applied the same rule. Being clever, we classified difficult feelings like anxiety, doubt and uncertainty as things to move away from, and emotions like happiness, excitement and relief as things to move towards. This makes intuitive sense, but applying the away and towards rule to our internal world leads to problems. Think about something you've done that you're really proud of, like running a marathon or passing an exam. And then think about the early days or moments when you were moving towards this achievement. What were your thoughts and emotions then? The short term result of moving towards something we really value is usually negative thoughts and uncomfortable emotions. So our minds tell us to move away, just as if we saw a bear or a moving bus. Then if we do move away, the first emotion that shows up is relief. So to summarize, language has encouraged us to try and move away from bad or difficult thoughts and emotions and to move towards good ones. But this is a trap because it can mean we move away from what matters most to us in life. This is called experiential avoidance. Experiential avoidance can work in the short term, but the problem is it doesn't tend to work in the long term. If we make it a priority to avoid difficult emotions, we start to construct our lives around avoiding things we don't want rather than moving towards things we do want. So what do we do about this? 
In order to beat experiential avoidance, we firstly have to understand what our values really look like. What do we really want from life? Then we need to help people to build their willingness here, to experience these difficult thoughts and emotions, in order to keep moving towards here. We can't have love without fear of rejection. We can't achieve greatly without fear of failure. And we can't change our lives for the better without worrying that we will change for the worst. There is no way around this. It is the human condition. All right, just to pause, just to read through that line and take a little breath <laughs> and just reflect on how we're talking about towards and away, experiential avoidance on the left side, being engaged on the right side, right? This is, this is, this is what we mean by the matrix and this is just coming at it from a little different a perspective. But we can cultivate the ability to experience difficult thoughts and emotions in the service of what matters most to us. This is called psychological flexibility. Psychological flexibility helps us build a life around towards moves rather than away moves. Whilst this can hurt, we get to do the things in life that matter most. And this makes a difference. So that little video uh, is available online. Headstuck, if you Google Headstuck, Rob Archer, it's available and, and you can review that at your leisure or share that with others, right? But, but it also allows us to modify our question a little bit because you can ask that same upper right quadrant question about other walks of life in which you might be involved. And then there's also room to entertain the lower right quadrant question of why does this matter to you? How does what we aspire to do flow from our values? And we'll come back to that, but this is just to start to round out the quadrants and the way we're going to do a little dance through the matrix. Well, okay, so we said the three skill sets were awareness, openness and engagement. And now let's start to take a look at each of these in a little more detail. So this is the skill set related to awareing, to noticing. One of my colleagues in Canada, Benji Schoendorf, came up with a couple of characters. This one he calls uh, Flexi, you know, that, that uh, incredible Zen meditative presence that uh, you know, is available to those of us who attain enlightenment, but unfortunately, I hardly count myself among that, that esteemed group, and, and I'm not sure any one of us actually get here. Um, but if what we're going to look at is working on our skills for awareness, then we're going to be working on noticing that 3D box in the middle. And, and we see mindfulness used a lot in our society these days. Um, and part of the challenge is to recontextualize it and put it in the context of our values as matrixing does. But I just wanted to briefly introduce two forms of practice. And some, many, most of you might already have encountered these. But all I want to do today is talk about some very brief exercises that can be incorporated into existing routines rather than belabor meditation practice, which is not to say that if any of you are into that or aspire to that, that's not great because it is. But let's just look at this in, in, in a more manageable kind of way. And what I mean by that is we're just going to do a one minute breathing exercise. Now the exercise here is just to breathe. It's just to notice your breath the air moving in and out of your nose or your mouth, your shoulders, your abdomen rising, falling, 
but you try to stay with your breath all the way in and all the way out. And as we do this, we get distracted. Not because there's something wrong with you, but because that's the nature of the human mind. And, and so we get distracted. We have thoughts, we hear things, we get an itch, we wonder if we're doing it right. And, and the task here is that each time you notice your attention is moving away from your breath, you gently and kindly redirect your attention back to your breath. Now, the way I like to practice, and, and you know, you, you hardly have to do this, but there's this app called Insight Timer, I-N-S-I-G-H-T Timer. And there are a lot of different apps out there. I happen to like this one, frankly, because, um, because I like the sound of the bell. I picture a little uh, Buddha in a temple hitting a gong. So I think it's a pretty cool electronic sound. A and in addition, you can set it for different time durations. So I'm just going to ha use a one minute preset. And the way I have this set, I have a 10 second wiggle built in. So when I turn it on, I have 10 seconds to get settled. You hear a bell. And as the bell fades, you fade into attending to your breath, noticing that you're getting distracted and coming back to your breath over and over again for one minute. Well, let's try it. There's the 10 second wiggle. Here comes the bell. And as the bell fades, noticing our breath in whatever way it comes to us and returning to breathing each time we notice we're getting distracted. Okay, so that's that's one minute. And you certainly can um, do this for a longer period of time if you're so inclined. Um, but I'm just looking to see if we can get a little bit in play in association with an activity in which we're already engaged. Say, you know, when we brush our teeth in the evening um, at, at, or as part of getting into bed. A different way of doing this is a listening exercise where for a minute we just notice the environmental sounds around us. It's really hard for us to hear a sound and not start to give it a label. But the idea here is just to let sounds come to us. Some are constant and some are intermittent and there may be sounds of silence. But in this one minute exercise, all you do is just let sounds come to you. And as soon as you notice one sound, just get ready to hear the next sound and the next sound and the next sound. And, and some people really prefer this auditory channel meditation. So let's, um, let, let me um, get back to my timer for one minute. And again, there's gonna be this uh, 10 second wiggle and then a bell and you can listen to that fade and then just see what sounds come to you over the course of the next minute. So there's our 10 second wiggle. And here comes our first sound.
Now you hear the sound of my voice and the pause in between my words. Just listening. Just listening. And so as part of ACT training, we oftentimes will look to see, are there some ways that people can build in a little bit of meditation? As I said, if there's interest in a more formal meditation practice, by all means, pursue that. And there are apps available. There's the Calm app and there's the Headspace app. But some people prefer guided meditations. I like to introduce these without a lot of words so that people get a sense of that. But when we talk about the skill of awareing, what we're looking for is some way of enhancing our capacity to notice. And practicing that component skill in that way can then set the stage for us to work on our next skill, the skill of openness or increasing our ability to weather thoughts and feelings um, as we uh, go about our daily uh, existences. Well, so now we're over on the left side of the matrix. We're talking about opening, right? About becoming more accepting. Now, Benji also created this character superimposed on the matrix that he called Spiky. And uh, I, I dare say from my own personal experience and uh, I suspect from uh, a good number of the audience, we all know just a little too much about uh, Spiky than we would uh, prefer to know. Um, I think uh, a little more realistic um, approach from my perspective is, you know, uh, maybe not getting all the way to a uh, flexi hood, but if we can bring just a little bit of flexi to bear on our spiky days, you know, sometimes that little bit of flexi can make uh, quite a bit of difference in terms of our ability to manage. And so, um, you know, here's, here's the agenda, right? I mean, if you can get here, more power to you. Uh, a lot of days I'm pretty content to see if I can get to here. A and let's take another look at a different video. There are two minor modifications that I would like to see made in this video. Um, I'll mention those a little later, but for right now, this is just a, a, a little video, video of uh, a meditation um, for you to uh, try on for size. Hmm. 
Oh, wait a second. Let's get back to here. Okay, so before we move on, uh, the two changes I would like to see made in that video are first, all the way back at the beginning, it says change your thoughts and you can change your world. That's where ACT is a little different than a lot of approaches because we don't really try to change our thoughts. It's more like we make room for our thoughts, right? It's, yes, we notice them, but then we kind of take them along with us on that vector from lower left to upper right. And so we take our thoughts and our feelings and our reactions along with us and maybe they fade and maybe not. Uh, but we don't really change them. Uh, we change our relationship with them, if you will. And then, uh, I don't know how your lives are, but at the very end, in, in addition to thinking, oh my goodness, I wish it were really that easy, I would have loved that fly to come back um, and land a, a, on the samurai's uh, face again, because our issues just have a way of coming back and coming back and coming back, don't they? Now, it is interesting to me, though, that you know, the flies became the vehicle for the transformation. So if you think about these lower quadrants of the matrix, a couple of my colleagues say, say this in a couple of different ways. Uh, my colleague Steve Hayes says, we care where we hurt and we hurt where we care. So values and suffering are connected. If we're in distress, we usually don't get in distress about something we don't care about. And caring risks suffering because they're connected. My colleague Kelly Wilson says this a little differently still. He says values and vulnerabilities are poured from the same vessel. So he's talking about, right, the same kind of phenomena in a little different a way but respecting, indeed honoring, the connection between caring and distressing, because they're linked the way a life presents itself to us. And, and so this affords us the opportunity to do a little different a meditation. The ones we did earlier, uh, the breathing practice, was focused on concentration, on focusing on our breath, and then when we got distracted, we would come back to our breath. And so those thoughts and images and feelings that we had were labeled distractions and the nature of the task was to come back. The listening one started to move us more towards this open focus meditation because we, we were still trying to concentrate, but on whatever sound came and whatever sound came and whatever sound came. And this open focus meditation is more akin to that. That is, what we're gonna try to do is sit and engage in noticing our thoughts, but when we start to notice that we're thinking about something else, we just notice that thought. And then if another thought arises, we notice that one. And then if another one arises, we notice that one. So this is much more like sitting on the, uh, the, the riverbank and watching the river flow by, just watching the thought stream flow by. Sometimes this is called open focus. Other people call this choiceless awareness because we don't really choose what shows up, but the nature of our task is to become aware and to watch. And so it's building kind of, if you will, a flexi presence and if something shows up for us that's more on the toward side, a pleasant thought, a memory, a recollection, we watch that. But if Spikey happens to declare his or her presence, then we watch Spikey and we watch Spikey and we watch the flow of thoughts. Now, if this becomes uncomfortable for you, just go back and focus on your breath and just stay with your breath and watch your breath in and out. 
And as you get settled and centered in your breath, then you can go back to watching your thoughts. And so with practice, people gain some facility with knowing kind of when to move back and forth. Um, and, and again, let's just, um, let me bring up my Insight Timer app and get over to my presets. And, and let's do this initially for one minute again. So um, you know the protocol at this point, there's a 10 second wiggle, you know, maybe get settled into your breath and then just open things up and start to watch the thought stream flow by. One thought to the next thought to the next thought. Okay, so that's one minute of open focus meditation. Now we're gonna do this again for two minutes. Uh, it, it's, you know, it seems like it's just a minute more, but it's actually a, a doubling of, of the amount of time. And, and I just like you to kind of get a feel for it. And if, if two minutes is, if you're okay with two minutes, that's cool. But a lot of people find they'd rather start with one minute um, especially if we can get this, say, built into your bedtime routine, that this is just kind of what I do when, when I get in bed, um, whether it's because I use a, an app or I put a little kitchen timer by my toothbrush or on my nightstand. Um, but, but sometimes people will, you know, start with two minutes and they'll say, oh, okay, I can do that. And then they'll go to three and, and then they'll find that they skipped it one night and they said, no, I'll do it the next night. Uh, maybe you will and maybe you won't, but we have to be careful. So I'd just like you to experience two minutes so you can see what that's like. And, and again, if you're able to stay with it and you're good with a two minute one, um, that's fine. You know, if it starts to become a little uncomfortable, you know, maybe shift back to that thinking about where do you want to be a year from now or just see where your thoughts take you. And, you know, if your thoughts go to, uh, you know, your grocery list for, for the weekend, you know, take note of that and then see if you can get back to your breath. But let's just try two minutes because I'd like you to get a sense of what that's like and see what might be right for you. So even with a two minute one, um, I still start out with a 10 second wiggle just to kind of get settled and centered. And here comes the bell. sitting on the mental riverbank, watching the thought stream flow by, settling into watching your breath. If the stream is flowing too quickly,
if you slip down from the riverbank into the river and get carried away in the current only to realize you forgot what you were doing and you started to think about something else, notice that and come on back up to the riverbank. Breathing, noticing, watching. Okay, so that's two minutes. And, and just no, make a mental note for yourself, you know, that that was two minutes. And how did you experience that in contrast with the one minute? Because that might inform, you know, where, where you want to start if you're indeed you're going to start this kind of practice. Um, if you have other questions about any of these uh, meditations, um, I'm trying to keep track of time in such a way that there'll be ample time at the end for questions and attempts at answers. So if you do have uh, questions, um, you know, keep those in mind too. Um, and uh, I'll see what I can do to clarify uh, what might be emerging for you as you try these exercises on for size. Now, we also can take note uh, 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 in terms of this skill set that we can move pretty quickly from those finger traps at the beginning to thought traps. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, you know, something happens, right? And we react to it. And we start to tell ourselves a story about something that's happening. And then we get stuck in that story, in our lower left quadrant story. You know, uh, what are the stories we tell ourselves? Uh, why me? Good question. This isn't fair. Absolutely. It's probably not. But if only, yes, agreed, but not. So, so this is what we do, right? I mean, we get stuck in that lower left quadrant and we can get pretty stuck there. Um, you know, people sometimes will compare it to quicksand, you know, and what do you do in quicksand? Well, you don't move. Well, okay, but I don't really like that metaphor because after you don't move, what do you do then? because then, you know, you're stuck. And, and so we need some way of noticing our thought traps and then being able to figure out how to move with them, right? So we're gonna play this little game called ABCD matrixing. And, and I'm gonna run through it and then I'll put it in the matrix before we actually practice it so you can get a clear sense of what I'm talking about. But the idea here is that we're gonna notice an issue that gets you hooked. And it could be a reaction you're having to this very presentation. It could be something in your outer world. It could be something in your inner world. But something gets us going. And the nature of the challenge then is first of all to notice and then to assess in that lower left quadrant, looking at it from that 3D box in the middle of noticing. What are your emotional and physical reactions? What do you sense? What do you see going on with you? And then B, behave. What are some of your favorite away moves? Um, what do you typically do? Or what are you doing in this particular instance? Or what do you remember from a, an incident you're thinking about from this morning or yesterday or last week that really got you going. C, consider how you might more effectively engage the issue, right? You see how we're moving to the upper right quadrant? Not so much judging, more describing what did we see going on and what do we aspire to? And D, who or what matters to you about this? And now we're back in the domain of valuing back in that lower right quadrant. And in ACT, when we talk about values, we talk about this in a little different a way than, than typically may be talked about. 
we're not necessarily necessarily talking about morals about shoulds we're talking more about qualities of being the kind of people we aspire to be in the world it's it's often analogized to heading east right i mean you can go east you can get to a destination that's east of where you are now but when you get there you still can go east from there if you aspire to be the best possible parent you can be there's a lot we can do along the way but the aspiration continues to guide us over time so when we ask who or what matters to you about this that's what we're thinking about with the lower right quadrant so let's take a few minutes to try this on for size right if we put this into the matrix and this can be a useful exercise to practice from time to time when it happens to occur to you to think about it in these terms so here's the ask here's the invitation think about a time when you know you you know you got hooked something really got you going in your family, at your job, as part of getting to a destination. Someone in a grocery store, someone in a drugstore, something going on politically, but something that stirred you up. And just now, take that meditative breath and notice. Notice, see if it even comes back to you right now as you sit here and just, you know, close your eyes and take a slow breath and just see if it comes to you. And then ask yourself, how did I manage? What was my B to my A? What, what, how did I move away? And is that typically what I do? You know, did, did I get angry? Angrier than I want to be? Did I avoid a situation? procrastinate we all have our favorite away moves they show up okay and now consider you know if i was a little bit more together a person you know if i if i handled whatever it was that got me going a little bit more effectively what what might that have been what, what do I kind of wish I would have done differently? And then D, determine who or what matters to you about this. What's the valuing underneath the distress? What's the valuing that informs how you would rather have handled it and what you would have liked to have actually done differently. And, and so there's, there's a, an application that you can try on for size. You know, the next time you happen to notice that something's got you going. Now, the cool thing about the matrix from my perspective is that we really can start, and you're starting, I hope, to get a sense of this. You can really start anywhere with this. So you can start out with that question that's informing this, this workshop. You know, what kind of parent do you aspire to be? And, and then you can go from there. You know, um, we can start out with who or what matters to you as we did prior to our question. We can start out in the lower left quadrant, but maybe sometimes we pick it up in the upper left quadrant. You know, we notice we're behaving in a way where we say, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm losing the show over this. Uh, more times than not, we're not losing the show over this. You know, if we're already living at 200 degrees, 12 degrees can boil us over. And then we can look pretty whacked out, like you lost the show over 12 degrees. No, you lost the show over 12 degrees because the flame was already turned up to 200. And, and so it's really important to notice our temperature because the challenge then is, is to turn the flame down. But nonetheless, 
if, if you notice you're hanging out in that upper left quadrant, then you can ask yourself, all right, well, what got me going? What's my lower left quadrant about? And, and again, we're trying to be much more descriptive than judgmental about this. What, what got me going? And then if we can notice that lower left quadrant, then we can go over to the upper lower right and we can say, all right, well, what's the caring of, what do I care about such that I'm in this de degree of distress such that I reacted as I did in the upper left? And then we can go to that upper right question. You know, what do I wish I would have done just a little bit differently? And maybe, just maybe, we can make a pledge to ourselves that the next time that kind of situation shows up, we're going to see if we can handle it just a little bit more in alignment with the kind of person we aspire to be. Well, okay, and as you can see then, these three processes are interconnected because we've been talking about engagement, right? That really informs us all along the way. Indeed, when you do that one minute meditation or two minutes, if you choose to start there and you set an intention to come back to your breath, that's kind of engaging. That's setting the stage for what you're going to do. And so it's practice because you keep coming back to your breath just the way we keep trying to come back to valued behavior, even when we get distracted on the left side by reactions and behaviors that are a little out of alignment with uh, the way we aspire to be in our lives. Well, okay, so now we're talking about engaging. The ability to remain engaged in doing what matters, even when, perhaps especially when, we're being challenged externally and internally. And, and so let me just briefly give you an example of, of the power of this and of, of what transformative change can start to look like. So you may or may not know this story, but um, Roger Bannister, back in May of 1954, did something that it was said the human could not do. At least it had never been done before. No one had ever run a mile in less than four minutes under timed conditions. Now that's not to say that people hadn't been running sub four minute miles for millennia, but no one had ever done it under timed conditions prior to May 1954. And then <clears throat> a man named Roger Bannister did it. After an intensive amount of training and preparation and pacing, he ran a mile in three minutes and 59 and four ten seconds. First person to do it, never could be done, was the story about us humans. But the really intriguing thing is that within six months of Roger Bannister doing it, talk about the little engine that could on steroids, within six months of Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile barrier, a number of people all around the world ran a mile in less than four minutes. It turns out it was not a physiological barrier. It was a psychological barrier. And once he was able to persevere and transverse that vector from lower left to upper right, other people started to do that. Now, it's also really interesting because the current mile, world mile record holder it, it, it ran a mile in three minutes and 43 seconds. That was in 1999, and no one has done faster than that since. But if you think about it, that's like 16 seconds faster than Bannister, which is utterly amazing. And, and that's, on, that's on the guy side of this. Within a matter of weeks of Bannister running a sub four minute mile, the first woman ever ran a sub five minute mile that had never happened before. And now the world record um, on the women's side of the ledger is like four minutes and 12 seconds, a whole lot less than five minutes. And, and so 
what am I saying? Uh, I'm saying that uh, change is possible, right? Change is possible. And now in working with athletes in a way that this simply was not available to Bannister, right? Now the ACT matrix is part and parcel of the way we routinely work with athletes as well, helping them use this framework to be able to manage themselves more effectively. So just a little story to take with you, right? This is all about then, yes, and we humans tend to respond, yes, but. A and but is an interesting little conjunction because more times than not, it has the effect of disqualifying what came before. Yes, but, and then we disregard the yes part. Act it is really about the only approach to this kind of training that says yes and. Not trying to say they're there. Not trying to say, you know, if you do this, you will feel better. Uh, you may not. Indeed, if you think back to that head stuck video, you know, when we try new things, we may actually feel worse. If we're really going to try something new and different, it's like, hello, it's new and different. We really don't know how to do this. And so what's going to show up? <clears throat> Doubt, anxiety, uncertainty. And, and what makes the valuing part of this so important then is why in the world would any of us ever want to wade into the left-sided distress unless it is in the service of a valued pursuit. And moreover, how could we possibly engage in an activity that elicits distress without that 3D box in the middle, without the skill of being able to step back and, and gain a little distance so that we can start to entertain the valued, preferred way of being in the world along with the distress we're feeling. <clears throat> so if I'm articulating this in a way that's useful, <clears throat> that's why we think about this as a vector of yes and. Well, okay, so here's our question. What would you be doing differently a year from now if you could be just a little bit more of the kind of parent you aspire to be? And, and now you know. Now you know how we move through this. We ask, why does this matter to you? What shows up and gets in the way of caring? What do you do to move away from your distress? Well, what if you were going to put some a mark in your calendar, your outlook or your paper calendar one month from now or three months from now or six months from now or 12 months from now? What if you were going to write matrix colon and a word or two that would clue you into what it is you want to be doing differently a year from now? Right? So what if you could entertain this question? Right? Well, what about in one week? If next Friday, you were gonna have a little mark in your calendar that was gonna lead you to say, okay, let me think about it. Did I take some small step over the past week that's leading me to think that I'm on my way to where I wanna be a year from now? What about by bedtime tonight? If you were going to do one small thing yet today, one behavior that would lead you to think, I took a step. Now, maybe that one small step could be marking these things down in that calendar of yours, but maybe it's something else. But when you get in bed tonight, What's one small thing that you could take note of having done? And so by way of review and moving towards allowing time for your questions, let's just do a quick 
workshop review. We talked about the parenting aspirations and just as I did in the previous slide, the idea of would you be willing to take a little time to make some notations for yourself in your calendar just so that you can set an intention for what you're gonna work on using the matrix over the next year? Might you consider building in a nightly meditation practice, one minute, two minutes, using the insight timer, using a little kitchen timer by your toothbrush or by your nightstand. That listening auditory channel meditation is a really nice one, actually, when you get in bed at night, because then you can just sit and listen to sounds. And, you know, if someone's walking and the floorboards creak or someone flushes a toilet, instead of that being an annoyance, that just becomes a sound that you listen to. But could you get this built into a nightly routine? You could build it into a morning routine too, but I don't like to mess around with people's morning routines. Can you engage in some matrix practice of one sort or another, the ABCD, um, some other form that works for you, picking it up in any quadrant? Maybe you could just go explain the matrix later today to someone else in your family and have a little conversation about it. A and then, see what kind of questions you have and what kind of questions they have about it. Now, um, if you would like to know more, um, there are underscores between ACT after each of these words, but contextualscience.org is the umbrella organization for ACT, and there is a, a public listserv, and, and there's a listing of a lot of resources related to ACT, and so uh, those are all available to you, and that would be, I think, a natural place to turn for, um, for additional information. So let me see if I can um, stop sharing and get back to where we need to be and see what kind of uh, questions um, have emerged over the course of the last hour or so for you. Yes, and first I just want to say thank you so much. Um, I know I learned a lot that I will be working on this matrix. I'm excited and I feel relaxed from the meditation. So thank you. Um, so we do have a couple of questions and like, like he said, feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A. We do have um, time. So um, if you have anything, just enter it in there. So um, this is a two part um, from um, a parent. So their first part of their question was, how does one bounce back after years of burnout? Um, her, then she went into more detail. She has a son with PWS. Um, she's learned to suppress her emotions to not disrupt her son, who's extremely hyperreactive. She suppressed them so much with him that it's tricked, trickled over time into her life. She's now unable to react to things that bother her and her affect is flat. And she sometimes has to pretend to react to good or bad news because she's trained herself not to react. How does she get out of this into the right side of the matrix, she said. Well, uh, kudos for being able to articulate that question, right? Because you've already started, right? Just being able to step back to ask that question, I, I think is totally awesome. And, and I mean, I think we all ought to just take a breath and, and honor that mother, that father, whoever it was who asked that question, because we all struggle with that. And then, you know, my response is go very, very slowly. Uh, I mean, history is powerful. The challenges and complexities are powerful. Uh, one of my favorite meditation teachers, a woman named Tara Brock, T-A-R-A-B-R-A-C-H, says that every once in a while, we should just in a very gentle gesture of self-compassion, every once in a while, just put our hand over our heart and take a slow, slow breath. So maybe start there, you know, maybe start small. Um, maybe do a little bit of breathing at bedtime a and then try more of it on for size. Try more of it on for size. Maybe go to the website, do a little bit of reading. Um, you know, if the struggle is too, too much, maybe getting some additional professional guidance could be of help. Um, but I, 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 I'm impressed that you were able to articulate that question. And I would say, carry on with that. 
taking small, small steps up that vector from lower left to upper right. The only thing I would add is you're actually retraining your brain um, after many, many years of a pattern of behavior. And like Sue has said, you're noticing already what has happened. Um, and so using that paradigm of one small step is where you need to start. Wonderful. Um, our next question is, are there any workshops available online um, for PWS parents? Uh, Jan, I'm going to defer to you on, on that one. Uh, maybe this yeah, can serve as a I, springboard. I don't know. <laughs> I think maybe it, the people are telling us that we should take this on the road virtually. Um, well, we have our intervention that we're doing right now. Um, as far as ACT goes, I think this is the only one specifically focused on PWS that I, I am aware of. Um, there may be some other relaxation interventions um, that are out there, but I'm not familiar with them. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, do you find that open focus meditation before bed can be challenging for some because it's hard to shut down that river of distressing thoughts or never ending to-do lists? If so, would you, um, would you recommend to those of us that have a hard time shutting, what would you recommend for those who have a hard time shutting their minds off? Yeah, I really appreciate that, that question, right? Because it seems like, well, meditation, I mean, you know, for all the side effects we talk about with medications, what are the side effects of meditation? It seems fairly benign, but not necessarily, right? Because sometimes if we check in with what's going on with ourselves, you know, behind our eyeballs may not be the friendliest of places to hang out. So yes, by all means, anytime, if you start to do that open focus kind of meditation and it's distressing, uh, especially early on, by all means, let it go, shift to breathing. I like the auditory channel one because it kind of gets me out of my head and into listening. So especially if there's like a rainstorm or if it's a windy night, those things are really awesome to listen to. But anything can become the meditative focus. So John Kabat-Zinn, who's been one of the major proponents of meditation in the Western Hemisphere over the last 30 years, talks about things like shower meditation. He says, when you get in the shower, many of us will start to think about stuff, things that we have coming up that we're worried about, things that happen that we regret. He says, some days, sad but true, his most pleasant moments come from that hot water beating down on his back. So he says, make that the meditative focus and just feel the water, right? Maybe a shower before bed is an awesome time to practice that. But you can do dishwashing meditation, right? Where you can just pay attention to what you're doing any activity can become the meditative focus. And yeah, so if things get too busy at night, shift over, shift over to auditory channel and just let the sounds come to you, right? And, and, and just be gentle. Maybe every once in a while doing that Tara Brock move of just gently putting your hand over your heart and taking a slow breath and, and then coming back to listening. And start out small, right? Because big doses of this stuff can be very difficult. And so, yes, if there's too much machinations going on, shift channels. If it's during the day and you're outside, you can do visual channel meditation. You can start to just notice sights that are coming to you as you walk along. If you're in the grocery store, moving down an aisle, just for three or four or five steps, walk really slowly. Just slow things down. And with practice, then this starts to inform other aspects of our lives. Thanks for asking it. That's an awesome question. The only other thing I would add is that in addition to open meditations, there are also more focused meditations. Um, so I use a technique with my folks called square breathing, uh, where you do some mental counting um, and you're, you're, you're 
breathing uh, in a square way, inhale, hold your breath, exhale, don't breathe. Um, and you work, work your way up to eight seconds on a side over a period of time because you can't do it right away. But that's a focused meditation, which we know decreases heart rate, decreases, um, improves respiration, uh, which definitely sends your brain a message that says, all is well, calm, um, which I think is, is beneficial, especially at bedtime. Yeah, and another quick one, a fun one, is to, to count but not to keep, not to count breaths. So if you breathe in, breathe out, count one, breathe in, breathe out, count two, breathe in, breathe out, count three, breathe in, breathe out, ah, go back to two and one and zero. It, it just draws our attention in. And I can't tell you how many times I've tried to do that where I'm counting to three and I wind up at like at 17 because <laughs> I totally lost track of what I was doing. And then the appropriate response there is instead of calling your, ourselves names, we just smile and see if we can do three counting up and counting down. Because I'll tell you, you know, and if I do three, if I go to five, I rarely can cannot go to six. But you might want to practice that. No, those are great. I love square breathing. I do. I meditate each morning and I, I do square. Ah, sweet, sometimes. sweet. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, another question. Have you had any experience with parents doing this practice with their elementary age PWS child if their child already loves yoga? <laughs> Dan, you want to respond and then I'll weigh in too? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to hand it to Stu because he ah. had this wealth of experience working with special needs kids uh, in his preschool. And so I'll let him segue to that. Um, yeah, it depends on the verbal capabilities of the child, right? I mean, and, and yes, if there can be some conversation about this, there can be some conversation about this. However, um, we build in yoga, just not, not to try to help kids manage, but that's just part of the skill training that we have built into our curriculum. And then we do any and every of a variety of other things, blowing bubbles, blowing on spinners, putting teddy bears on tummies and watching them rise and fall. If a kid's able to draw, they can draw pictures for each of those four quadrants. So, so if they're able to process at that level, uh, we, we have a number of kids where, where we're doing the matrix, but we're not doing it with words, we're doing it with pictures because they can more process that and, and they can mix and match. And we actually do some curriculum based in helping kids learn what goes in each of the quadrants. So absolutely, I mean, there are a whole host of different ways that you can move with this in ways that are kid friendly, taking into account the developmental level and the developmental capabilities of the individual child. And my experience with older kids with Prader-Willi syndrome is it's very difficult to teach them how to do uh, abdominal breathing or which is, you know, that diaphragm supported breathing. And so you have to do it sort of um, in, in a fun way. So they can use a straw and they can scoot a, a cotton ball across the table and you can make a game of it. Um, you can have them blow up a balloon, um, which all of which causes you to you know, have take a deep breath and, and also let it out slowly, which is the, uh, the element to, to help the brain relax. Um, and then the best one recently, you know our guys aren't the best um, singers, but I, I was trying to work with a young man who loved to sing. And so you make a game out of who can hold the note the longest. Our guys are very competitive. And so anything you can do to try to use that tool to help them um, increase the length of time that they do the exhale part of the breathing works very effectively. Yeah, great suggestions. Thanks, Jan. Those are great. And um, I had a question about um, access to the matrix. There is a link that was sent uh, with the reminder for today's um, session. It was at the bottom of the email. Um, and then I also have it in the chat. So I think that, um, Dr. Libman, there's a few slides and then it, there's blank matrixes, correct, for them to right. use. Perfect. But anyone can sketch it out on their hand anytime soon, you know, anytime you encounter a situation, right? So you can take it with you everywhere you go. Perfect. Um, and we have, um, looks like one last question. So if I was gonna start 
to use this, how, wh where do I start with this? What's the best way? Yeah, that, that's great. Um, I would suggest starting with just noticing towards and away. Just in this moment with what I'm, I'm doing. Am I more moving away from distress or towards doing something that matters to me? Right, because that that that's where it all hinges. That's key. Because as soon as you ask that question, you're in a different place. You're actually as soon as you ask that question, you're actually in the 3D box in the middle. But if you can just start noticing towards and away, and then maybe just see what happens next, and maybe add in a little bit of some form of meditation practice that works for you. If you can start to do those things. You're, you're well underway. The, filling out the entire matrix, yeah, you'll get there eventually. But I'd start with towards and away and a little bit of noticing practice. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. I, I know I learned a lot today. I, I think all of our attendees did as well. Um, uh, just a reminder that this was recorded and we will be releasing all recordings of our um, of our talks in um, early November. So you'll be able to um, watch this again um, if, if there were pieces that, that were missing for you. Um, so let me.